Chapter 10, Part 3, Allylic and Benzylic Radicals and also Radical Additions to Alkenes. So let's talk about what we mean by allylic radical. When we say allylic radical, we are talking about a radical that is formed in the allylic position. The allylic position is one carbon removed from an alkene. So for example, there, 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 this is an allylic alkyl halide, and so is this. So the allylic radical is uniquely stable because it has a resonance form, um, which you can draw like this. Take one of the electrons from the pi bond and show that you're creating a new pi bond. So those electrons are now here. And then this electron goes there on the end. So that is the arrow pushing that gets you between these two um, radicals. Um, this is the most likely position for a radical halogenation. So if you are looking at a radical reaction and you have an allylic position, this is where it's going to occur. Um, so allylic radicals actually rank higher even than tertiary radicals. So you can kind of readjust your um, previous assumptions and put allylic before tertiary, which comes before secondary, which comes before primary, which comes before vinyl. Um, vinyl radicals are radicals that are formed directly on the sp2 carbon. Those are typically very unstable. Um, so you usually do not form those. So let's take a look at allylic substitution. Um, if you take an alkene and you react it with chlorine, previously what we saw with this, um, without the presence of heat, was addition across the double bond, right? So previously we did this reaction and we got this. But if you add heat, it becomes, or light, it becomes a radical reaction. Um, so the chlorine is going to split and initiate the reaction by creating chlorine radicals. And then you end up with a radical um, mechanism product. So this is required at high temperature and you typically want to have a low concentration of your halogen, um, less than one equivalent, because note, we don't need one equivalent of the chlorine molecule to make this. Whereas if you do this at low temp and with one equivalent or greater of chlorine, you're going to end up with the electrophilic addition product. Allylic bromination um, can also be done with a compound called N-bromosuccinamide, which is often shorthanded as NBS. Um, this is just a much more stable way to produce bromine radical. Um, the NBS provides a constant but low concentration of bromine radical within the reaction mixture. Instead of adding in um, bromine, uh, molecular bromine, which will not form radicals very easily on its own. Um, the initiation of this process looks a little different, but the propagation and the termination is the same. So we don't really need to worry about it. So let's talk about benzylic radicals. Benzylic are pretty similar to allylic. Um, when we say benzylic, we mean one removed from a benzene ring. So previously we saw allylic was one removed from an alkene. Benzylic is one removed from benzene. So there, 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 and there. The benzylic position is resonance stabilized across all of benzene's conjugated pi bonds. Um, so this is even more resonance stabilized than the allylic ones that we saw previously. Um, so the benzylic position is extra stable and therefore the most reactive. So if you react toluene, um, which is this compound here, with n bromosuccinamide, you're going to end up brominating in the benzylic position. Um, if you react toluene with chlorine in the presence of light or heat, um, you're going to end up doing multiple additions um, to the benzylic position, and that reaction is going to happen very quickly and easily. Very difficult to slow down and control.
So let's take a look at the possibilities um, when you have a benzylic position. So if you are to react um, a compound such as ethyl benzene with a halogen radical, um, you actually have two different places that you can abstract a hydrogen atom from. So in the dark blue, we have our benzylic position. If you were to abstract that hydrogen atom, you would end up with this radical. If you abstract the orange hydrogen atom, oops, you end up with this radical. Now the difference between the two of these is really just their relative stability. Um, the top one has a benzylic radical, which is much more stable. Um, you can see that by drawing out the resonance forms. Um, I'll give you a head start on that. So you can take this electron, put it here, take one of the electrons in a nearby pi bond and put it here, creating a double bond between the benzylic carbon and the carbon of the benzene, and then take the other electron and put it on the carbon um, that is holding onto the other side of the alkene, and that will get you to your first resonance form. You can then move the radical around the ring. However, you cannot do that with this one, with the primary radical that was formed um, one position away from the benzylic position. So this one is much more likely to form because it's much more stable, and therefore you're gonna get a product based off of that one. So if you add another equivalent of the halogen, you can look at your two possible products. Here you would have the halogen added in the benzylic position, in the bottom one, you would have the halogen added in that primary position. And if you were looking at um, the outcome of this reaction, what you would find is that this is major and the bottom one probably doesn't form at all. Okay, let's take a look at radical additions to alkenes. Now, the nice thing about this is that you've already seen this. Um, you have already seen the reaction um, that causes the anti-Markovnikov outcome between a halogen acid and the presence of peroxides. What you didn't know before was that the peroxide is a radical initiator, and um, that's what leads to it producing the anti-Markovnikov product. So let's take a look at how this happens. Um, so in the beginning, you have your dialkyl and you add in heat or light, and it's going to split apart, giving you two equivalents of the alkoxyl radical. Oh, sorry, my cat just tried to walk across everything. In the next step, your alkoxyl radical reacts with the halogen acid, abstracting the hydrogen atom. So one of these electrons gets here, this electron comes here, this one gets put onto bromine. And now you've created an equivalent of an alcohol and also a bromine radical. Now remember, the radical wants to create the most stable radical when it reacts with um, whatever it's going to react with, in this case, the alkene. And so this is how you end up with this anti-Markovnikov situation, because the bromine, in order for a radical to form in the secondary position, the bromine is going to have to add to the end. So we're not doing an abstraction here. What we're doing instead is forming a bond between the um, primary carbon of the alkene and the bromine radical and creating a radical on the secondary carbon. So we end up with this species. And then in the next step of the reaction, we take that radical and we terminate it by reacting with the hydrobromic acid. So we're going to abstract a hydrogen atom 
and create a bond between the hydrogen atom and this carbon, essentially. I know that's not exactly what it looks like is happening, but that's what's happening. And so we end up with our anti-Markovnikov product because the last thing that we added on was the hydrogen rather than um, finishing up by adding on the bromine, which is how the Markovnikov process works. Remember, Markovnikov goes through a carbocation. And it goes, it starts by adding on a proton first and adding on the bromine second. The anti-Markovnikov mechanism here um, goes through a radical and it starts by adding on the bromine and then it adds the hydrogen on second. 